gave an illustrated lecture, and the series has, has been happening for the last 16 years on the second Saturday of every month. We are delighted to have Radha Krishnan today for our 265th Meet the Artist program. All our lectures in the last one and a half years are held online. It's one of the blessings of having it online as we are able to have people like Radha to give our talk. Thank you, Radha, and over to Jatin Das. <clears throat> yes, Radha Krishnan is a dear friend and a known Indian sculptor who lives in New Delhi, originally from Kerala, who studied art in Santaniketan. I've had very close association with Santaniketan. My sister used to study there, so I used to go there from 1958 onwards. <clears throat> Sorry. The professors that he uh, studied under, I knew many of them, including uh, uh, Ramkinkar Beish, the great artist, the great sculptor. And he was very lucky to study under him. Before we start the program, I would like to reminisce three people who passed away recently. That is Jaslin Dhamija the great designer of handloom and textile. And she also had a program with the Meet the Artist program of the Jedison Prabhat. And thereafter, Vivan Sundaram, again, a dear friend and a very established artist of the country, died young recently. And Sunit Chopra, the art critic, a veteran art critic who passed away just last week. And this is all going to happen with all of us, but these are eminent people who have contributed to Indian art. And we should not only reminisce, we should share with each other. Radha Krishnan uh, has been working continuously. He's a sculptor, figurative sculptor. And uh, Having had the mentor in Shantaniketan, now I just learned today that he's establishing a center in Shantaniketan. Uh, that's very nice. And uh, uh, he's originally from Kerala. KG Subramaniam Mani also was in Shantaniketan. Krishna Reddy, the printmaker. And Shiva Kumar now is there, who's the art historian. So, uh, Radha, uh, uh, please talk about your work. He had also come, you know, the JD Center of Art that we have established in 1997 in Bhubaneswar. Uh, we had a sculptor's camp in 2004, which he had also attended with somebody, Rai Chaudhary, and numerous other contemporary and traditional sculptors. And I'm very happy that we're doing this 266 Be the Artist program. I think it's one of the few institutions in the country which has continued this uninterrupted. It's online now in collaboration with India International Center of Delhi. Now, Radha, please speak about your work, show your work. And for people at large, not only artists, art lovers can also get to know you more. Thank you, Radha. Thank you, <clears throat> you Jatinda, so much. It was, um, it's always uh, wonderful to be associated with uh, <clears throat> such a center that is established by an individual artist at a scale which is moving, so which is creating different dimensions and which is probably, you don't see many art centers are done by the artists, you know, but in the, uh, like in the West, you have individual foundations and many other programs that you have. And to here, probably this is one of the first initiative, I would say that an artist has come up with a center and uh, has a room for, 
artists and different uh, people from various streams and and i wish all the best jdca and uh, uh, of course to our friend jatin das i wish you a uh, uh, you know a longer life with healthy life that's what is a kind of an opportunity that i would like to sort of share with you stay well and do more and this is the great thing that's happening in the country okay can we thank you thank you just to say this will be this is the only center for folk tribal classical and contemporary art that's right and and i don't call it a museum it's an art center yes please carry on and talk about your work and show yeah. your work <clears throat> of us well like like any of us that i have gone to study art in one of the art institutions which is one of the foremost institutions in the country that is shanti niketan the kala bhavan but with the idea that i would like to become an artist a painter because nobody at least to the best of my knowledge that i know that you know nobody goes to an art college to become a sculptor unless it is very you really practiced it before but people like us our time we i have never done a sculpture before for i landed in shanti niketan so the idea was to do painting and um, those years <clears throat> the you know there are three subjects basically focused that is print making and sculpting and painting and i took to the idea of always painting to start with but somehow you know after at three months of my classes in the kala bhavan you have the chance to go to the studio sculpture studio and to make certain initial attempts in in clay clay modeling and that's what when my some of my works were really appreciated by some great artists who were working there who were teaching there like like sharbari rao choudhury i was very close to and they, he himself noted my sculpture and he told me maybe you have a you can can you can focus on sculpting so i started really sort of taking it very seriously but this two two years of integrated course that you have in the five years from the third year that you start specializing in your subject like any other college that at the after completion of two years i decided that i'm going to take up sculpting the the first and the foremost thing about this campus that you see the image of kalabhavan campus that you have this tree this is called the china bot tree that is in the that is probably the heart of the institution and then there is a small kind of a stage there so most of these classes or i couldn't say classes but maybe you can really say it's like you have the big adda after the even during the from the very morning you know teachers and students they all share and sit under this tree and and have an informal chat because the whole philosophy of learning in shanti niketan was to be a part of the nature because be with the nature and instead of you know classes are happening you know in a kind of a very man made architect man made space but you straight from the life that you start working that was the philosophy that was uh, with which that tagore had envisioned Uh, an art institution that was uh, initiated and started by nandalal bose now <clears throat> now i i could see some of these great sculptures in the campus and they were extremely inspiring you know this is a, one of the very famous sculpture called santal family done in 1938 when rankinger was almost 32 years old when he did this sculpture it's a sculpture that is done directly in cement and uh, most of the sculptures were there in the campus and some of his sculptures were already in the department even you know in the open there are most of the cement sculptures because that was the main medium that was used to those days by the teachers and the students i had this opportunity a year before he passed away in 1979 ramkinger uh gave me the permission to do a portrait of him and uh, well this is the this is the sculpture which is in the campus which is in the which is in the museums of many museums like in bharat bhavan and lalit kala academy and many other collections this portrait of ramkinger is there 
which was it was not an easy task to get him seated to do a portrait. I understand even Jatinda also has done a portrait of of um, of Ram Kinkar, maybe straight from life, a sketch or something like that. Now, the other professor that I was very close to was Professor Sharvari Roy Choudhury, who I became not just a kind of a student teacher relationship, it was more like, you know, we have been so friendly, very informal relationship, a kind of a, a brother or so I call him Sharvari Da. So, and his sculptures were very different. He did extremely small sculptures, very, very market forms, uh, which could uh, which could be sort of, uh, you know, carried even in a pocket because it's that small. But at the same time, they are very, very, really extremely sensitive modeling that you can see of the way he handles clay or wax, that you can see that, uh, you know, they are very freestanding sculptures. So in that scale to do something like that is not an easy task. So you have a great master like Ramkinger on one side doing monumental sculptures, and you have another sculptor who doing very miniature, very small scale, but yet very sensitive uh, sculptor. Then, you know, because Sharbury is also is very famous for his portraits. You know, this portrait, doing portraits is something that was very much in practice in Shantani Kevin. I think it was even Ramkinger probably started his career doing a lot of portraits in the, when he was a student. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that it's the school of Shantinika, the school of sculpture in Kalavavan is probably sort of practiced with a lot of people search for students and then kept on doing portraits. So this is Ali Akbar Khan uh, sitting for Shalbari Roy Chaudhary. And you have other printmaker. So these three people you have to know about Ram Kinkar Beige, uh, Professor uh, Sharviri Roy Chaudhary, and then you have Somnath Hoor, the great printmaker. So he was heading the printmaking department, one of the most, most important artists of our time. He did a mural outside the graphics department with the Vikram chips and things like that. And also, you know, the whole approach was to sort of to get everybody together, involving all the students and to have the kind of work collectively happening, which could be a mural, which could be anything, whether it's whatever medium. So this is one way of learning. See, whenever I'm talking about the teaching, nature of the teaching there or nature of the learning, that the teachers do work in the department. That made a lot of difference, unlike today. Today, most of the teachers are probably having their own private space, but that was a different time. The teachers did work along with the students. See, Shandini Kedan is a kind of a place, it's like a very, very, uh, kind of, what do you call it, very village, very, very uh, rural atmosphere where people are basically sort of working with local materials and things like that. This is one of the photographs I am showing how the local people are making jaggery out of the date farm. So this is the kind of locally what they can explore, what they can make farming and doing all kinds of activities of, you know, what, what can be available from the nature is what they really got into the productions. And this is just to sort of show the engagement of the people, because Shantini Kedan, as such, has no periphery. It really opens up to villages and the canals and the other, other Santal villages. So it's a kind of an opened up space. I, I think that stays for a, forever, because there are attempts which are being made to be different. Now, one of the, see, one of the, one of the days when I was a student, probably I must have been 21 year old or a third year student, coming from one of the Santal village back to my department in a cycle, I met with this boy who was probably working in a tea shop and he gave a kind of a great smile and uh, he was asking for Dada Ruti. So this asking for Ruti was very unnatural because you know you really make a very sympathetic face and then asking for almost like begging for something. But here is somebody with a great smile and asking for that was something that was that really did something to me. It really touched me deep from inside. And then I asked him, what's your name? Then he said, Musui. So I just want sort of to introduce who was Musui. Where does the Musui, the idea of Musui comes to me? 
So this boy, I said, listen, why don't you sit? Why don't you come and sit behind my cycle? I will take you to the department, the Kalabhavan. So he was very much more than willing. And he sat and I took him to the department and he sat. Or he did, he was there. I did a portrait of Musui. And with whatever coins that he earned, he goes to a barber shop. He comes back with a clean shaven head back to me, back to the studio. So with a great smile. So I really was thinking, oh my God, this is more sculptural now. So I also did some changes on the sculpture initially that I did. And uh, he became a model for the Department of Sculpture. So he stood nude for all of us to study. So we worked on clay as he stood for almost a month, maybe 15 days, months, and then he became a permanent model because he had a kind of a, the, 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 you know, where the body that was extremely, you know, uh, very idealistic kind of a, a kind of a structure that he had, which was very interesting to sort of make studies. It was not muscular. It was almost like kind of a, a Buddha standing, you know, almost like that, with no muscles and no muscular goods beyond, beyond this Western notion about what a human body should be like. So that was something which people are connected to, and we did the. So when I when I completed my studies after in 1981, after my masters, I was I applied for a scholarship to come to Delhi, and that was a scholarship offered by the Lalitkal Academy to work in Gadi Studios. And uh, when since I was selected and I was coming to Delhi, and I didn't have anything much to take, and I took only the head of Musu, and this was the part. This is the head that they have carried, almost all the space wherever, whichever place that I had my studio in Delhi, I always shifted this head. So this head has become a permanent fixture in my studio. I think it started with some little garages, you know, because when you come to Delhi with a kind of a small fellowship and then to make a kind of a start you know to become a sculptor i mean these are all things that you know very tough to talk about because it was a very tough situation very the toughest type part of the time because you have a fellowship for a year after the fellowship what do you do you're on the road so it then what happens is Anything that comes to you, any opportunity that comes to you to do a sculpting, then you start doing that. Things has never been easy like the way it is today. 50 years back, or I mean, I, I came to Kalabhavan and it was 42 years back I came to Delhi and there are not very many galleries that dealt with the sculpting. So the, the whole process of to be with, to, to continue to do sculpting was a very tough task. But well, well, one has to con continue to be doing whatever scale that you can. So I remember I used to do small sculptures those years. And then whenever I had the opportunity, you make, make it bigger. So this Musri is a head that has always been there with me, with a great smile. I always, it was very inspiring. And I never felt alone. I never felt lonely having him around in my workspace. So this smile I could always share with him, back to him. So in 1990s, in 93 only, I have completed my studio in Delhi. And this is in Mahroli, my studio. And uh, prior to that, I was working here and there in some uh, rented spaces of smaller, bigger, like that. But ultimately, you wanted to have a high ceiling, a kind of a design the studio for yourself. So in 93, I could manage to, 90, I bought the land and in Maharoli, I made this studio, uh, which is where I'm still working. Uh, well, there is a sculpture that I'm talking about because some of the earlier sculptures that I really to describe about is India Habitat Center. I, this sculpture is there, uh, which is a, a, a woman seated, a woman seated here on a split base. And, uh, you know, a kind of a very precarious situation because most of the sculptures that were getting reflected is something very connected to your own personal life. Uh, to trying to find a balance on, of your own in a, on, a, on a kind of a very precariously placed plates 
that you are fighting a kind of a balancing act. So I always call it here, woman sitting seated on a split base. It is permanently displayed in the India Habitat Center when you enter. On one side, this is on the left side. And on the right side, you have another sculpture, which is called the Chandela Rider. The Chandela Rider also is done in 1989, 90. The, the sculpture is made later in bronze. This was done in uh, after, soon after my visit to Kajuraho. So here is a figure, uh, here is a female figure that is riding a dog. And for whatever reasons, I felt it greatly inspired with this Chandela's in, um, in Kajuraho, and that was probably the inspiration behind, and also a kind of a, a, a kind of a structure, which is really unusual, and I wanted to sort of to get into that structure the way Kajuraho sculptures were being made. So these two sculptures were from the 1980s, late 80s, and uh, you know, soon after that, I got some of the opportunities to do uh, is, you know, enlarging some of the sculptures from these small sculptures to a very monumental scale. And that is what this pool is all about. The sculpture is installed in the south of France. And from 1993 onwards, I have been working on some of the sculptures, trying to do bigger in scale. And, in, uh, and you know, this series of sculptures that I kept on doing from 93, 94, those many years, uh, especially that sculptures are all mostly installed in France for the reason that I've met with a gentleman who has a foundation and uh, he was ready to take any sculpture that I was making for uh, for a, some of the sites which are very spread. It's very acres and acres of land that is in the south of France and where I kept the sculpture is called the whirlwind. So in 1993, I had a major exhibition in France. And uh, I, I think this is Sadanand Menon who came, who has brought out a full Times of India page for me, uh, uh, which I probably would not have got it if I exhibited in, in Delhi itself. Because when you do something you know, outside the country, then probably you know, people really respond to that. And I got a very large coverage back home. And, so what I'm trying to say is that, you know, with all the kind of struggle that you had, and you still have it, of course, everybody has a struggle, which is an ongoing in one way or other. But this to do major large sculptures has always been one of the things that I wanted to continue to be living with, which that opportunity had come to me, I would really say, for the last almost 30 years I am working on large bronzes, which could be kept outside. So this is an exhibition that is sponsored by the, the Jindal Group, when they really wanted to bring out a magazine called the Art India Magazine. So they approached me because Mrs. Kanodia's daughter, Sangeeta Jindal, she decided to bring out the magazine. And she came and told me, <coughs> Ratha, I, I, have, I have grown up looking at your sculptures in my house. And I would like to launch this magazine in your exhibition. So this sculpture exhibition was, uh, these sculptures are displayed at in Kolkata Park Street by the APJ group. So the, the exhibition kept, you know, it was visible for the people who really passed by. It was an open air show. So that was sometime back later, so probably the same time. You know, I was invited by the International Travel House asking me if I could do a sculpture with the idea of travel. So what meant to, what travel meant to me was to do to a person taking another person. That was the kind of an idea like a rickshaw in Kolkata, because my familiarity with the city and the people and and uh, and uh, the this motif has made a, such a strong impact in me to choose the subject of uh, making a rickshaw puller. But he is not really pulling a rickshaw, but it is almost like kind of standing next to that, a kind of, you know, what do you call it, a kind of a choreographed posture of the rickshaw wala. So I made this sculpture so big, it's so big that even I could sit inside that. It's a large bronze that is kept in Sheikh Sarai in Delhi, that you can see this sculpture kept on the ceiling of the, on the, what do you call it, the terrace or the terrace of the building. 
and that the sculpture is there. And uh, so this, this is the first time when I decided that a rickshaw puller should be doing that. And then who could be pulling that rickshaw? That was the first time but that I approached Musui. Musui, would you be doing that job for me? And that was the smile, the smile I felt was, I mean, he added a little more to that smile that he was very much willing to accept that job to be a rickshaw puller. And that's why Musi pulling a rickshaw here and I could sit comfortably behind him. And my journey with Musi starts from here. Musis and Musis are all light, very light. And how do I express that lightness? The lightness is shown here with, you know, that they can walk on the leaves and the tukes and things like that. So while working on this Musui, I felt the whole narration is not complete unless there is a counterpart. So in the process, I have conceived a Maya. Maya is a fully fictional, imaginative kind of a character, but a takeoff from Musui. So it's almost like added hair and feminine expression and to make it a kind of a Musui and Maya. So these are the two characters that I have been working with for the last many years. So Musi becomes a rat catcher here. Why rat catcher? Because I was watching that film of uh, Elipathayam by Adur Gavalakrishnan, and then I found this character who is also inserted in the, in the, in, in the rat trap. And also he has the satisfaction of catching the trap. So, that was the base, based on the sculpture, and based on that, the sculpture has been concealed. So Musi becomes a rat catcher here. And Maya becomes a writer. This, you know, the writer, it's a kind of a motive that, hap that has always been happening. And um, maybe because of I keep seeing Mimi, my wife, you know, keeps writing whenever she is out not doing the painting. So writer is a a continuously 3D, who, whatever character that sometimes with a great gap, I would really come up with writing ideas. And now here becomes a creature here. And Musi, Musi becomes a Jesus. And also, if he can be Jesus, why can't he be a, even a devil? So Mus, I was reading those books about the Mullah and Asruddin stories. And then Musi becomes the Mullah and Asruddin here. And when she, the Maya, becomes a graduate, right? How, how does she, you know, she's like, she's ex, extremely, you know, the, resembling the same Mohanjadaro dancing girl with the bangled hands and with a posture and everything that is a small three inches tall, small sculpture from Mohanjadaro. I made it into life size and with the Maya's head and the same posture, but holding this Shaptapardi, this Shaptapardi is what we call it in Bangla, Chhatim. This Chhatim is what we get on the convocation day as a kind of a thing to carry or to carry along. To, 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 that is what is given to us by the chancellor of the university. The sculpture later has been installed in Kamala Nehru College in Delhi. And uh, this Maya, you know, is conceived to be a kind of a circular figure. And uh, she is, uh, you know, on the crest of a wave. The sculpture is installed in HCL building. You know, it was purchased by the Shivnada, uh, Shivnada's organization. So Maya becomes a windmill. And also Musi becomes a windmill. Any, it's not that they only have to host, you know, the characters which are known. It could be also sort of uh, objects that generates life, which is like, you know, energy. So this process, I really could choose them becoming a, a windmills. So it's the first time they are holding each other's head. Musi have Maya and Maya has the Musi. So they are the first time they are coming together on a platform, same platform. It's kind of airbound, and she becomes an angel. Also becomes a Nataraj, dance of Shiva, and or and becomes the Mona Lisa. So Maya becomes the Mona Lisa here. 
a beautiful site was given, offered to me to do a sculpture in the south of France where the edge of the water and the mountain background where Maya could be walking on the, on the edge of the water. Because what happens is that, you know, the, the kind of Maya and the Musi that I have been working on of a different kind, because they are impishness, impish characters there. So she becomes the arrow and the boat together. And so the moment I did this sculpture, I always felt that this has to be made bigger. And I was looking for an opportunity when I could do this sculpture much bigger and, and a right context with space that could be best for having this sculpture to be installed. And the chance came to me in, in the Tago's house. This is the house of Tago, the last house, Udayan in Shandini Kedan, where I was offered the 150th year of Tagore. I was offered by the vice chancellor of the university if I could give a sculpture for the university where I decided to make Maya becomes the arrow and the bow. Then with all these sculptures that I have been doing it in the West, in India, in many places, in many, many, many cities and towns, well, Delhi Tourism approached me if I could do something for the Garden of Five Senses. And uh, this is a sculpture conceived for that, that there's a heritage column. And uh, the Maya is sort of perpendicular, hanging on to her, hanging on to that pillar. And uh, the sculpture is on the rock, almost on the rock. So with all these individual sculptures that was happening, and my studio has been shifted to Mehroli. And uh, when this Mehroli studio was built, I could see a lot of, lot many, the colony was coming up. Many, 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 many houses were getting built, but because of these people coming from the rural belt to the urban scenario, looking for some job, they don't have any money or anything as such. They really want to have some job. They just want a daily wage they are looking for. Little, little jobs these people look for. So these tiny figures, I, I started creating, looking at these anonymous tiny figures, a lot and lot in numbers. Because that's what I have been seeing from the rooftop of my studio. A colony is coming up. It's called Ambedkar Colony. And uh, Chhatrapur Pahadi, it is located at. And uh, they make just boxes. They were making human boxes. It is just the box where they really want to make a living. But the box has got people crawling onto it, people standing it, people. It's just not a home, but it's just the box. And the people are coming from all over. They get into all kinds of a space, whether it is a vessel, they become container, they become, they become anything. They really have come with the idea, probably will get an, ident an identity of for themselves for a time to come. But I don't know. But this effort kept, you can see there are 1,600 colonies in Delhi that is not regularized, that doesn't have the basics. But now, with, over a period of time, we have electricity and the water that is being given to them. His colony is still not regularized. And I am, I am seeing as a migrant, I am also seeing being in that colony. And all these years, I could understand the kind of problem what they are going through. I never shifted my studio. So it's a kind of a global migration scenario that people are coming and gathering and trying to find a kind of an existence. So these little figures are getting into Mosuri's head and Maya's head. And that was the time in 1984 when uh, JDCA is first sculptor's camp that I could participate. And the local stone I have never worked with before. And uh, I was very happy to see this opportunity where you know, people are really landing in uh, landing in Bhuvaneshwar. You know, the center is that. Look, that you know the the same site, the same site. The sculpture is being made. I created pockets in stone, and they made this. Yeah, I made this as a, like a kind of a cover, a thakan. You know, it is almost like these little people coming from all over, a kind of a dimensionally spread. And uh, this local stone, I enjoyed working on that. And uh, along with many other sculptors, it was a very beautiful experience. I relished that. So I work, I changed my, I changed my scale here. The Musuris and Mayas 
are probably around 13 inches now. They are going together on a little ramp. Two, just two of them together on a little ramp. And uh, so they become five, six, or maybe sometimes 10 of them coming together to a reaching into a kind of a different height. And you know, after that, it is hundreds, hundreds of those musuis and mayas are, you know, on kept, they are really sort of making a make movement in whichever directions, though they are individuals, they have certain kind of an agenda. They all reach up, they look up to a kind of an image which is larger than life. And these are photographs taken by a very close friend of mine, very intelligent photographer, very sensitive, a Prabhupada's Gupta. He has been shooting my sculptures from the time that I started sculpting because we were together in our life together. We started and I met him, he was 20 years old. So I was, so we became extremely good friends. And whenever I did a sculpture, he would, I don't have to tell him to come over to my studio to take a photograph because he knows. He takes a photograph and he shows me how it could, my sculpture, how I could, how I should look at my sculpture. It's not like that, you know, I'm asking him to do a photograph, which I know about, but so he opens up with a kind of a special dimension for me. The kind of wrapper between me and Prabhupada was a lifelong enduring friendship that we had. Now that I have lost him for the last 10 years, I miss him a lot. But some of these photographs that you can see of all these people, you know, these Muslims and Mayas are on the ramp, you know, they are really reaching out to a kind of a, a different height. Looking at Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, looking at a kind of a saint, somebody who is saint, or somebody who is reached at a different kind of a level. I mean, that's what the uh, so this Ram Krishna also is a Musui. This Ram, the people who are down there also walking are also Musuis and Mayas. So they are, he is not somebody who has come from elsewhere. He is part of, he is one of one among that. So you can see the counterpart Maya becomes Sharada here, Sharada being seated, and the people are really reaching out to her on a ramp. And this was soon after our coming back from uh, Egypt. You know, this in the Egyptian mythology that you have this guardian goddess. It's called Selkit. So Selkit is guarding in the Egyptian vase that you can see it in front of her. And she is guarding what? That's the people. Because for her, the treasure is the people here. So the people of the people that I have always been focusing in the, as a concept, a running idea, a recurring, you know, culture that has been happening in most of my sculptures. So the sculpture is exhibited in many places. And then I keep going to Shantani Kedan and I look up, I look, Musi is still working in the same tea shop, maybe a different tea shop, but he is still there. Thus, he is a Santal boy who I started my sculpting. Uh, the portrait that I am still living with in my studio, but his expression, of course, keeps changing, but there is a kind of a hidden smile. And there is a, even there is a, you know, behind that smile, there is a lot of pain. I could see, I mean, that's what even my own sculptures also, I somehow see that smile is, you know, smile take you to a different kind of a space. It is not what you look at. It is not what that does to you. That is what probably the Musi is all about. So I started working on a different scale called the freehold sculptures with the minimum contact on the pillar, on the crest of the pillar, you know, these figures are being placed. And uh, this number of sculptures, and this is possible only in bronze. I don't think that any other medium gives you that chance. That with a little elbow, you know, the, such a huge figure, which weighs around 100 kilos, and that can stay on the crest of that little corner. And I kept on doing that practice of making, maybe again a writer coming back here. Yeah, the writer is, she's, coming from elsewhere and landing on the crest of it, and she starts writing. The sculpture is in Baroda, in Uttara, and I did a many, many, many sculptures at the site. She's also a writer, tally writer. See, when you say freehold sculpture, she is not touching anybody else. She is, if at all she touches, she is touching herself. So it's very playful, very unnatural kind of a postures. You don't see them, but it's a movement that comes from within not with any kind of a reference of a walking, running, or any of that. 
it is just that they are what they are supposed to be playing like you can see a face to face sculpture here again and almost like kind of a little terra fly very little contact can you believe a life size sculpture with let's say little contact so many many sculptures of that period in 2006 i completed making this freehold sculptures and once i have a large set of sculptures then i take them to an exhibition that this was the bombay museum gallery posted my sculptures of all the two three years of my work i put them together in an exhibition and uh, it's an it's a different kind of an experience when you have plenty of them on a different kind of a pillars of different height and it's almost like being in the woods so maya walks with a boat boat is one of the series one of the motif that i have always been you know continuously working on maya instead of traveling by boat she is having she is walking with a boat with a lot of people in it and instead of going home she is she is carrying the home and and there's nobody else to give you shelter it has to be done by yourself with a palm leaf and here he becomes the turtle and necessary when it comes he comes out and gives a kind of a preaches the world well what has to be done in the crisis and he gets his he takes his head inside so maya decides to look at the mirror or musi decides to look at the mirror but sees only maya on the other side so this you know this <clears throat> series of sculptures where you can see here also they are they are like kind of you know there's a crossing they are just crossing a void there's a pitfall but you can cross the void well it's just because of it's the question of you know the kind of connectivity and how do you complement with the next person next to you you know that's what makes it possible so this is the time when i made you know kind of a human square with a pillar and on the top of the pillar i really saw a somebody is taking a look at what's happening on the ground i call it a terra fly and but i wanted to make it bigger that was you know when rampinka and that was the centenary year of rampinka in 2006 i started working on you know the curating of the exhibition for the national gallery and then i was also invited by for by the kalabhavan where if i could do a sculpture in the campus so i decided to do a terra fly and the sculpture is like this you know the person the sculpture is kept on the top of it taking an aerial view of what's happening in kalabhavan of many many people are there walking around but they don't really see the sculpture because sculpture is kept much high so once you look up then you see the figure but somebody is taking a look at you that whether you are carefully looking at him whether you are seen whether you are seeing that figure or not but you are seen by somebody else you are being looked at there is somebody keeping a track of all your steps in shantini ke den kala bhavan yes that is called the terra fly so this little figures again keeps them casting you know when i am traveling outside inside my foundry is very actively making all these tiny figures so these tiny figures are merging in the space they sometimes get cast into copper with the human square they really have it and they get into the how homes they they get into the boat and traveling on the crest of the wave so see, sometimes this boat is inserted inside the human web and then you have this head that is inserted inside the inside what inside the people the web the virtually they are that head is inside it's a kind of a virtual space that you can call it so it's like a big chimney that the smoke is coming out so it could be interpreted like anything else there are many things that you can do what you cannot sculpt something can be sculpted with the tiny people you know that's what this people so this people became my medium instead of clay or a plaster or something like that these are the medium my people little figures became the medium it's like a little breeze that goes through the railings and maybe the light how do i stop the light it's the light that comes with this little figures it's a steam that comes out the hot water it's steam that takes the lid off and that opens up so then you know this is a put put is a dish in kerala that is also done with the rice powder and coconut and then you have the steam 
So when the steam comes out, the leaks and everything that comes out in a different perspective. So it's again, you know, the kind of curl, a kind of a whirlpool, almost like kind of a spiral uh, movement of uh, the heat, the water. The tiffin box, well, what do you come out of the tiffin boxes? Uh, with little tiny figures. It's a kind of an entity that you can see with the heat and the smoke. Again, an idli maker. Idli maker is very familiar for Kerala people. And uh, I really use all my used, all my childhood, all these vessels which are of the brass vessels I brought into Delhi studio. And I started working, incorporating with my little tiny figures are becoming part of that. A little old fan that can give the wind. You know, and how do I sculpt a wind otherwise? I don't know. I don't know how I could do intangible and tangible. So this variations I kept working with these tiny people. So when the, the, when the flood in Kerala came, I saw the boat that was coming on the rooftop of the house. I could see that. So that's what this sculpture the idea. It's self-explanatory that what is this boat over the rooftop of a home? The torch, of course, the torch light, the light can only be made with these Katani figures. Everybody could read it as light. And the tapping of the rubber, you know, because I was brought up in the middle of the rubber in Kerala, especially at Kapote and the city that I come from, that's where the rubber estate. So you, tap, you cut it every day and then you have a kind of a coconut shell in that, you know, the rubber is being stored. So little fireflies on the lantern and Ephemeric, ephemera that you can see that this tiny moss that is reaching out to the light. So I kept this ephemeral sculptures, which are continuously I kept working on those boats as a series. People are reaching out to, you know, to the other side through boat. Sometimes they make it, but mostly they don't make it. They sink. But the light is what their aim is. They want to reach out to the light, whether they make it or not. So this tiny descent and descent, so these figures are which are gone, but the sculpture apparently had gone to the Beijing Binale and came back. And uh, I didn't know where to stop. Whenever I really feel, okay, here it is. Because now it's one way of living with this tiny people of Musuiza and Mayas. So I go to I go to Shantinagedan and I find Musi also having gray hair and gray beard and so I really could again connect with him. Either he's with like me or I am with I am like him. So we really growing old together. So Musi is still in Shantani Kedan, working in one of those little shops. I started working on this tiny other different kind of a Musuis. And it I started working on hundreds. It started sort of commissioning me a large, large job. On a hundreds of Musuis and Mayas that I started working on those, my studio has become almost full. So that was the time that I decided, okay, I should stop it here. And the sculpture was complete on a horizontal plane, a, a very horizontally, very, what do you call it? The Maya is taking off in the beginning on the ground. And then that is going cartwheeling and reaching out to a kind of a different space. So I call it a liminality, the liminal figures and the liminal space. At the end, there is a Maya that is standing symmetrically placed and her shadow falls on the wall where a different movement that starts instead of making a dead end. The sculpture is very big enough that just to sort of to show the scale that I am next to it. So I really looked up to that piece because this was something that was almost a kind of a, a statement that I wanted to make with the large life size and this tiny human figures on the ground. I kept working on this Maya taking off at bigger scale, of course. And this was the time when Kerala government has asked me if I could do a sculpture for Calicut. Calicut is this town that is the beach town where Vasco de Gama had come. The city that has gone through a difficult time in the history. I read many books about the city and I was told if I could do a sculpture, I said I want to do it because it's very political. So the Politburo in Delhi uh, has approved my making a sculpture in the campus in the center of the town. It's called Mananchara Maidana. 
So it's basically granite stone that I brought and the large musi uh, that has come casted from Jaipur coming and being placed there. People were, very, I was very scared because the whole green belt was, you know, it was destroyed because of the crane and a lot of uh, truck and crane and all that, the green. So people, what would be the reaction of the public next day morning? I didn't know. So morning when I, I sat at the corner at five o'clock in the morning and looking how the general public is reacting to my sculpting. And they are coming from all directions to, the, to their beloved, the best site in Calicut. And I had this little granites that had Mangalore tiles that is carved. And I saw the people standing and taking photographs. That was a great relief for me because that made me feel that they have accepted my public sculpture there. It is, that sculpture is almost 10 feet tall and around 700 kilos, that just only the figure itself, it's so huge. And uh, the landscaping was done with a, with a lot of stone, sand, grass and everything, the landscape is done. And the sculpture is complete. It is always there because of its, it's the most permanent mediums like granite and the stone. It will always be fair all the time to come. But once I saw, I was just sort of looking at one of the newspaper, I could see, you know, three people are standing on my musui and cleaning it. You know, it was an interesting experience because some people really decides, the public decides, you know, that probably I don't know where else it could be possible, that they really thought it's their sculpture, they have to keep it clean. And I was very impressed about that. And I, I keep doing my large sculptures in the foundry. I keep doing it in Jaipur and large sculptures from Jaipur to the site, I go and weld it at the site. So this was the Kerala government asked me if I could do a sculpture for the hometown where I was born, that is Kottayam. I absolutely gladly agreed it. And this is the result. Large, huge sculptures, three of them came together. And you can see me standing there. So you know the kind of scale it is. It's huge pieces and it's not a concrete base. It's a granite base. On the top of it, these three figures are seen for the public in the city of the port, city of Kotayam. This the same sculpture I sell it to uh, corporates. You know why I do the why I do this? Most of the sculptures that I do, I don't take any money. If it's a public space, I don't touch any public money because you know here this is a corporate funding. And that money, if I take out even 10 to 15 percent, if I keep it aside, I can make a foundation of my own that can really make me do a large bronzes of the second edition. And then I can install it in any city that I want to. That's the procedure because I have never, so nobody can make any kind of a complaint, which I don't want to, that the public money has been given to me. And why, on what basis they have been chosen, and this and that, such questions I don't want to have it in my life. So all my public sculptures, it is done by with my resources. So this was Goa, where I was in asked to do a public sculpture in Goa next to in Panjim. I started working on these tiles. I made them in fiberglass. I sent it to Bron in Jaipur. It has come after casting. After casting, the whole sculpture has come, and it's being installed in. Panjim next to the you know, promenade of this Mandavi River. The sculpture is there. Even the building itself is bronze. And uh, it's a very good location. It's almost like, again, Musi is taking a track of the whole floating population that is coming to Goa city, Goa, I suppose. So that sculpture is there forever. And soon after this sculpture, I was working on different projects. And the Supreme Court has approached me if I can do a sculpture for the Supreme Court. I said, well, why not? I have, I'll be very happy to do it because it's a very prestigious site. And they gave me, they told me you can choose the site. So I did with a lot of Musuis and Mayas of different scale, hundreds of them. And uh, hundreds and I don't know, I don't count. But constitution as a flourishing tree, whether it is a flourishing tree or not, that's a different question. But at least... It is meant to be a flourishing tree. And that was the idea, and it is kept in the water. It is in the Supreme Court. And then I started working on a different subjects in Corona period. 
ascending and descending, the heap, the way people are treated as a heap. I could see it and I could see it in the news and everywhere. So I really put people in a different kind of a perspective. The, the man standing with the soul, almost like a kind of a savior. And how do I sculpt a soul? Well, probably this is one way of doing it. And my last exhibition and Imami in Kolkata was, it was called the crowd. Yes, it was a crowd. The crowd I did with six years of my dedication in Shadi Nikhetan studio, I started one by one and the whole crowd, when I said, the whole gallery, I was suspicious. I was sort of afraid whether the gallery will be able to sort of cover the whole crowd. The crowd was so so a major exhibition for me. It is hundreds of those people were put together in one of the galleries. And that was me not seeing the show, not showing the show, not showing these people, but I was trying to see what it does to me after I display the sculptures that I could walk inside the crowd. I could also bring in people from whoever viewers come. I could see they are making a natural effort to reach into the kind of a space. They become one with the crowd. And that was the last exhibition. This exhibition is going to happen in the Bikaner House in, uh, in, in November. The sculpt, the, all the figures are almost six feet tall, taller than me. And I want people, all these people who are coming there and also witness it and become part of it. And that's what I think I could manage to make it on time. It's six o'clock. And thank you so much for listening to me. And if there's any questions that I would be happy to welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Radha. I think the whole journey of yours, you know, from Shantani Ketan, you know, coming from Kerala, then coming to Shantani Ketan, and the journey of, you know, having had the struggle, then come to Delhi. And this whole, I think the kind of, your two protagonists, and then seeing the life through those protagonists. Uh, I think one of the things you did mention, which is a very exciting nugget, is your curation. You know, your, how the kind of research work you did, of the letters of Sachidit Rai and Sumnath uh, Ho's life and Ram Kikar Bej's life and the exhibitions you created, the books you did. Uh, but that's probably for another time, you know, but, yeah. um, and I think because also like, you know, even when we had A. Ramchandran doing his talk, I think a lot of you worked with such amazing people in your childhood and in many ways they influenced you to it's see the world in a very different way. And I think uh, to have that kind of exposure from such an early age to break kind of that mold, and you know whether it was sculptors and artists and painters and teachers, so that's fantastic. And I think even the little uh, the stone and the bronze piece you've done at JDCA, you know that's a lovely thing. And it's it's lovely because also next to the other sculpture of Shalberi Da, yeah. that that's such a nice thing also. That thing. That's right. Yes. yes. But uh, Baba, do you have any questions also for Ra Radha? And then we'll open it up to public. <clears throat> open it to the audience. But it's very good that Radha has been working continuously on different yeah. spots. And uh, he has a very uh, big impact in the art scene. That's wonderful, but especially when he had mentors like Tinkarda. Yeah. From Nathur and all these people. That's wonderful. Now let's open it to the audience. Yeah. Does the... anyone have any questions? Uh, anything yeah. they would like to ask uh, Radha? Please go ahead and just uh, you can all switch on your video if you'd like. Uh, and just raise your hand or just unmute yourself and ask for me. I have lots of questions. If no one asks, I'm going to ask them. <laughs> but I'll give others a chance just in case. Yeah. 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 We don't say to, uh, so I think before, in case no one asks, uh, Radha, would you speak a little bit about your whole working on Somnath Ho's book and you know your research on Somnath Ho? 
Yeah, sure. Well, see, I met uh, Somnatha, that was in 1974 when I went as a student, of course, but then he was one of the very senior professor. So though he was a professor of that scale, that kind of a very, he was heading the department and most of the classes were sort of taken by some other professors and things like that. But he had a kind of a nature, he would mix with even first year student, you know, that because the number of students in the college were very less in number. And then he knew, you know, he kept a kind of a watch on how people are working, whether you are doing a wood cut or a lino cut. And, you know, he kept a track of everybody's involvement in, you know, in terms of printmaking and things like that. But it's, it was an exciting experience because none of us did any printmaking before coming to Kalabula. So it's always something which is very new. Most of the techniques, like I told you, we all knew the basic of the painting. That's what brought us to the department. But coming there, you get exposed to different methods and methods and different wisdom, like techniques and things like that. But see, meeting with Somnath Hoor and understanding him, because I kept a kind of a constant relationship from that time, from the first year student, kind of a continuous association that I had. You know, because of I could see in 1997, 1975, soon after the Vietnam War was over, that Somnath Somnath has done one of the sculpture. There is a, a mother and child. There is, you know, that's that. You know, she is standing. You know, with a extremely helpless or hopeless life. That this a, a baby clinging onto the chest of this mother with all the chest opened up, and standing there with the kind of you know, looking at the sculpture itself is a kind of evoking that experience that anybody could get into that space of what war does to human, you know, the world. And that uh, that sculpture, when I saw him doing in 1975 with the little rejected wax that was the students were working, that he was collecting and making that first sculpture. And I was a student in, I went in 74, 75, the war gets over and he did this sculpture, it's called The Mother and Child. So it was an extremely fascinating experience for a printmaker coming and doing a sculpture at the sculpture department. Of course, Sharviri Roy Choudhury and Somnath Khor and Ram Kinkar and Dinkar Kaushik. All those people were there, they were really were sort of keeping it, you know, such a beautiful friendship and association and discussions. And in all discussions, any student who wants to participate also could be a part of that. That is what was the greatest experience, something to remember about. So the centenary year, the Somnath Khor, who was born in 1921, his centenary year was 2021. And we and it was just, you know, Corona was getting in I was in full swing, actually, I should say the corona period. Well, I was also at home doing some little maquettes with wax and things like that. Then I, so I, I thought to myself, I don't know whether Kalabhavan as an institution or a university, are they going to do something related to the centenary or not? But I don't have to wait for anybody else. I have a small foundation called the Mosia Foundation. And I have an interest from my student life, you know, this archiving materials. Any material that was very important, I felt, but that has come so handy when since I have this approach. So Musiad Foundation's material was sufficient enough for me to make a start of documentation. Documentation is most important. Whoever having an academic interest, a person will naturally get into this documentation and the database. And my foundation was a, very much involved with making a little catalog only that I had the intention, making a small catalog and celebrate his. But then some, some you know, somebody came forward, that is Sanjeev Singh, Sanjeev Sanjeev, Sanjeev Kumar uh, of the Takshinda who came forward and then said, as I do it, we have enough, there no, there's no end to what you can do. So you just do it. So that, that gave me full confidence to make further documentation. I went to the collectors and different people who had whatever materials, any of the students, and putting them together. The whole book was being made. And then the exhibition was opened in Takshila in 2021, yes, two years back. The exhibition was opened in Chandanigiri. 
and it was a great, great uh, feeling. So a kind of a you know big tribute to a master whose life has been a great journey, you know, concerned with people and their tragedy and the kind of sufferings that Somnath Somnath Hor had done through his paintings and his all his expressions, his philosophy. So all that was sort of uh, very important for people, for all of us to. So I, my job was to sort of to create a kind of a big platform on which the further research can be made. So I think documentation is the most important thing. That was my focus for Somnath who's centenary year, you know. That's the way the exhibition is exhibition is opened up. So I have this big spaces which are people offered to me. You know, once you start something, there are many people will come and join you. So this is a big thing because unless you make an initiative and wait for somebody else to come, it will never happen. The JDCA will happen only because of a big initiative has happened. Now yeah. many, many forces from yeah. different sections, different sides, it will come to you, it will happen. It is, it's, it's, it's bound to happen. And that's the approach I took for Ramfinger Beige. I took for Somnath Ghor or even, even Satyajitre letters. You know, imagine 50 year old Satyajitre writing a letter in 1971 to a 20 year old woman with a man who is so busy with filmmaking and all lot of things and writings and writing a letter to a, a 20 year old girl who was just a fan. And imagine that their, their, their association, their writing letters that has become 52 in number. And those 52 letters were kept in a bank locker. I said, this is not done. If you don't open in 2021, or you know, that, then when will you open those letters? So I really insisted that the letters to come out of the locker and I want to really want it to be brought into a public domain with an exhibition and a beautiful catalog. So that's what was the number. So this my little foundation is doing whatever as an individual that I can. And then when we, the individual slowly become an institution, you know, over a period of time. So it, it's it's something that it's not a credit that I do it, but we all do it. I mean, we all have a lot to do more. And this country, everybody probably have a role to play to make it interest because such a culture we have, we know nothing about it, but a big, big force is there, which we have to be a part of that. Good, good, wonderful. You also did a book on Ram Kinkar Beige, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. And a uh, <coughs> large exhibition, you did an exhibition also. Yeah. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about it, uh, Radha? And then there's a question I wanted to, from the audience, which I'll ask you. Because yeah. about Ramkinkar Beige, even uh, A. Ramchandran, when we did the talk about a year and a half ago, uh -huh. he spoke so warmly about him. like And the kind of stories, you know, like even when I'm saying it, I've got goosebumps. Yeah, I remember when we went to meet him yeah. at his studio. And he said that, you know, as a that he was studying literature and he had gone to Madras then, I mean, now Chennai. And he had seen this work of his, and in Kerala also he had seen a work. And he said it just, it just, it baffled him. And then when he went to Shantiketan Ketan, and you know, as a student, first about how it was to work and study under him, and as a human being, as a professor, he spoke so warmly. And he said, you know, the kind of thing he would do, he would be brutal, and then he would be really warm. But he'd be brutal and he'd be warm. <laughs> I think that kind of story is. Uh, that's you must right. have also kind of discovered that whole side of his <laughs> and and also the kind of work he did, you know, because as an artist, like the Santhal one you showed, uh, A. Ramchandran spoke about that whole sculpture, like, you know. Yes, that's in, right. That's so right. we talk something about that also, because my whole generation, you know, we never got to experience, you know, people of that kind, you know. So. You see, uh, uh, when when I went, when I say Ram Kinkar was there in Shantani Kedan, but he was not a part of the faculty. But the people like Ram, you know, he lived in the campus. So for him, he he's not a kind of a person who would work at home in a closed door, you know, kind of. He will come to the department because he wants the same atmosphere where he taught, and he wants the same atmosphere where he can just work. 
So people like us, you know, we were just first time seeing a great master coming to the sculpture department and then taking clay. So we were all waiting for a little chance to come closer to help him, whatever he wanted. You know. But that we, everybody is waiting. What is that something that will call you? Maybe just come here, Esho, Esho, something to be done, you know, no. So he did, I remember some of the sculptures that he did before me when I was sort of watching it from distance and this and that, because he wanted silence. He wanted extremely, he was, he was fully involved while being in the department. And he did, I remember one of the sculptures that was three men dragging a goat for sacrifice. The sculpture was called the sacrifice. And that was just to post Naxal time. So his his impression of that Naxal, people were dragged to be sacrificed. I mean, and and but that goat had the human face, the struggle of that human. I we I and it, it made such a strong impression because we were there soon after the Max, you know, this Maxel movement and uh, and he kept on working on based on those series of ideas and things like that. And that sculpture, when I was curating the exhibition, I wanted that sculpture to be a part of it because it was so important a piece. In 1974, he did that. So I couldn't find where is that sculpture because it was not the department. Because one thing, with Ramkinger never lived with any of his work. You go to his home, there's not a single drawings that you can see it on the wall. So he had no work of art in his home. He lived a life, and of course, that was the later part of his life. I got him only for the last six years I got him. And those last six years of Ramkinger was my first six years. So it was kind of, you know, so, but then lucky, lucky enough that Shargurida was a very kind person to introduce me so closely to Ramkinger because, you know, with Ramachandran, the kind of feeling that Ramkinkar had, and with Radha Krishnan also, somehow he connected with Kerala and this and that and all. He had a very, he, when I met him first, he said, do you know Ramachandran? I said, of course I know about Ramachandran. So something there was about, you know, uh, that like he had a kind of an existing understanding about here is a, you know, here is another Mallu, <laughs> you know, <laughs> who is uh, again yeah. to, May I interrupt and add a little more to uh, Tinkarda? Can you hear me? Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, my sister used to study in Shantini Ketan literature. So when I was in Bombay at the JJ School of Art, every summer vacation I has to go to Shantini from 1958 onwards. And the summer was very hot in Shantini Ketan. Everybody was sleeping. And I got to know Tinkarda and I used to go and spend the, in the veranda of this mud house of his, he used to offer me rice beer, and I said, I don't drink. I remember. Hadia, Hadia, we call it. Whatever, Hadia, Hadia. 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 Hadia, banate to Hadia. Anyway, so he used to do the sculpture and throw cement balls onto the sculpture. And I was standing there. He used to wear a khaki pant, short pant, and a pate, and a little, little like a yeah. less less than a t-shirt and a palm leaf hat. He also gave me a palm leaf hat, which I had for a long time. So I, I spent a lot of time. He, frankly, there are a lot of people, are uh, artists, are sculptors or painters, but he was an artist. He was an orator. He would, while he was doing his sculpture outside, he would sing. And everybody was sleeping during summer and people will not come close to him. He was the only one in that uh, a garden while he was doing the sculpture. So I had many, many lovely moments. Yeah. I did a portrait right. sketch of him in 1960, which yeah, he signed yeah, yeah. and all that. But beautiful person. What a fantastic. What, what a fantastic person. I remember while he was doing a painting in watercolor, there was no blue. He got his blue, which he used it in clothes. He mixed that and did it. <laughs> yeah, you know? Yeah. So he had many, many. And I met Ramachandran. Uh, in Shantini Ketan when he was a student there. Yes, yes, yes. So, similar time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. was a similar fantastic time all over the country also. Yes, that's right. And they were, they were great people in every field. Uh, Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. There's a, question, there's a question from the audience. 
um, from Deeksha Bharatwaj. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. What is the primary idea that motivates you when you work with historical motifs or places? Vasco da uh, Gama landing in Calicut or the dancing girl from Monjadaro? <laughs> yeah. You see, uh, uh, well, to start with uh, uh, that uh, Mohanjadaro, the sculpture, well, you know, uh, probably that's the first image of a photograph that was something that the history book that I have learned about the first bronze. Even though I learned many, many sculptures, you know, many, I saw many sculptures in the family that we have, you know, many stone sculptures and things like that. And also you really deep into the sort of sanctum of the Spain, you know, temple that you keep looking at what exactly is the sculpture, you know, the image is all about, the first bronze of the stone. But this first piece made such a strong impact on me, which I really felt that she comes to study Shantanikyadan because it's almost like you cannot read really, certain things that you connect with your own self, but you don't really use your own self as such the kind of features. But here she comes to study BFA and then she has got uh, the MFA. So she studied this seven years in Kalabhavan as a student. That was the idea that she comes means, well, that was almost sort of connecting with one's own self. And then, you know, it's holding with a lot of pride this, you know, the life-sized Mohanjadato Dravidian, that character. The idea of that was naturally sort of bringing in, bringing in, you know, like whether it is a Mona Lisa or a Jesus or this and that. So you are trying to sort of bring in the kind of icons the kind of icons which are extremely registered in your own head. And that really gets sort of uh, contemporized in, with the way that she is holding the motif of this leaf that she is holding it. And the Maya that she is holding. I mean, she is becoming a Mohanjadara dancing girl, the Maya. The idea was what Maya is becoming. It's a question of that. It's not because always it's not the history part of it. It's also the question of the memory part of it, you know, what's uh, what's there. And even when Calicut sculpture, when I was trying to do, I had read a book of S.K. Potakart based basically Urdeshatin the Katha, the story of a the story of a city that was the novel for which the Ganpit Award was given to S.K. Potakart. So reading that as a child, and then what the Calicut city has gone through, it's a kind of a fallen situation and reconstruct it again. So this uh, it destructuring it and then again structure coming back, a kind of a cycle. So that is what the sculpture is titled with the Kala Pravaham. Kala Pravaham means basically the time tides, time tide. And that she's not the witness of the time. He, is, he himself is the time that has, that's what was the Musi can become the time. And that was the idea that when I really dealt with the city of Calicut, that there are fallen stones with the kind of Mangalore tiles. There are diagonally some of the sculptures are being placed. There is a just adjacent to that Musi standing, you would see a bang, Mangalore tiles in bronze that is kept on the crest of another stone. So it's it's only related to the whole thing of making and you know from the fallen and the falling. And again, coming back to its existence, verticality. So that's what the whole cycle that you compare it. It's the time tides and he becomes the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very There's good. another person from the audience, Vanita Mukherjee. Would you like to unmute yourself and switch on a video? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Mm, hello, Radha. Hi. Nice <laughs> to meet you here. And this was such an illuminating speech or a talk or a presentation. You know, we are all big fans of your work. And there's always one thing that has uh, struck me that, of course, you've given a very profound kind of a thing about, you know, Musui as time, but he was your first muse. And he has remained with you all your life. And, you know, through him, you have been inspired to create Maya, uh, you know, my first introduction to you was your sculpture on Ram Kinkar Bej through a documentary on him. Yeah. And I fell in love with uh, Ram Kinkar Bej. And ever since, every time I wonder 
you did such a beautiful and it was one of the most authentic it was almost as though his face was frozen in cement or that medium you used what has not motivated you to do more of that <laughs> you know to actually uh, go beyond muzui and maya and really recreate because that that is something i've always wondered yeah when i you know the port- making a portrait of ram thinker was i mean um, a kind of a, you know what you call it because what he did to me over the period of this five years because after i did the portrait next year you know so i got him only for six that was 1979 and in 1980 he passed away so i really have been with him very closely associated to to ram thinker and then if you really look at two profiles of ram thinker one of the profile was there is a kind of a, a different expression which was very different from the other profile so you really i really put two profiles together to create the print you know so many people ask me about the how does how does it work because we always work not from the print we always work from the profiles so that's what the technique of most of the sculptors use you know that one side of it you complete mm. complete it almost and then the other side comes and then the front the volume comes so it was very clear to me what the man and the sculptor the man the serious and that you know at that just opposing the two expressions was very important for me well talking about talking about you know what i really whether i could really continue to be doing many more portraits yes i really did many more portraits of many people i really did but then uh, probably i have not served with some of them are never shown so i think this is probably the first time in november in the bikaner house many of the portraits will come out because it's going to be a retrospective of the oh, works that, that that i have started from 1974 so it's almost 50 years so people asked me even damachandran himself told me there's no age for a perspective we can always do it now and later after if you wait for you know for you to be old enough uh, to do a perspective and all that probably you will not have enough works with you so now that you have your own works with you and if you ask somebody some bugs will come as a you know somebody will lend you the work to make it possible a retrospective is op- going to be open in november for a month which will have many many portraits portraits of some of the close people that i know including my wife <laughs> <laughs> yeah Wonderful. so yeah that's all to that thank you yeah thank you thank you very much hmm. anybody else had a very interesting talk by amba sanyal on bhavesh ada a few months ago on bc sanyal Oh. and you know a lot of people didn't know about the amazing portraiture he did yes to his life and sculpture that's right but one of the things we definitely want to request you rather later is to definitely do a talk on ram kinkar beach you know you are one of the few people uh you ramchandran shivakumar you know would be but you know you and ramchandran uh worked with him yeah you know, so uh so and he the ramchandran is not very well but you know so we would love it if you are able to do that talk sometime and you know even that lovely film that you quick attack made yeah on uh, uh it was just incredible like it was such a beautiful film yeah. and that kind of dialogue uh, are there any other questions by anyone a last question for the day uh before we end up and i think everyone will be really excited to see your retrospective you know <laughs> so that should be something quite exciting to look forward to yeah Baba himself also did a beautiful portraiture exhibition, which I think you must have also come yes, yes, in yes. Lalit Kala, uh, a different medium naturally. But yeah, anyone in the audience before we end up? So, otherwise, we thank you very much, Radha. Thank you for this lovely talk. Uh, it was fantastic to have your talk. We have a very lovely and exciting talk for our next month. on uh, someone i'm extremely fond of uh, jenny housego oh, yeah. who is an amazing textile curator and things it won't be a talk by her which she's not very well sadly but it'll be by maya mirchandani who has written this beautiful biography on jenny and jenny will come in briefly 
also for the talk. And I think she's inspired so many people in textiles from around the world. She was a curator uh, and then became a person, an entrepreneur, and then started working with a lot of Pashmina embroiderers, weavers, shepherds. Uh, and she's one of those kind of last of the doyens in textiles, I think. Uh, and the biography actually was has a forward by Leila Tayebji. Oh, yeah. Who was that's also a very good speaker of ours in the previous months. So I do hope all of you will join in and thank you very much, Radha. And uh, see you all in every second Saturday of the month. And yeah, thank you. Radha, you will do the Ram Kicker bit talk. Yeah, soon. yeah, yeah. yeah. Sometime that will definitely happen. And, yeah. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for having me and yeah. my association. You know, with the JDCA is yeah. very And we long. want you more at JDCA when it yes. opens. You know, yes. it will be lovely. Yes, I will definitely be a, there. So you have and to install a sculpture there. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you will have to decide whether it's going to be bronze. a Maya or a Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> and all our talks are available online, uh, you know, on YouTube. Yes. We, nothing that we do is based on commerce. We want... Uh, a lovely sense of network of people wanting to know more about people yeah. and about art in the larger sense of the word. Thank you, everyone.